ready? Uh-huh. Okay, this is a this is a picture of the Queen Elizabeth that I went across on, sitting in the parked in the uh, bay there at uh, Camp Shakes, New York, Port of Embarkation, New York, August the 6th, 1944, and 22,000 soldiers on it. Uh, can you imagine a ship big enough for 22,000 people to be on? And that, that, this is the ship that we went across on the Queen Elizabeth. And I, I thought you children would be interested in seeing something that tremendous, that size. That, that, see, that, that's more people, twice as many people, I believe, as there are in Palmer, whole Palmer County here that's on this one boat here going across. We, uh, we went across without an escort. We zigzagged across the, the channel there, uh, to, across the Atlantic there. We uh, anchored there in uh, Scotland, got off on smaller ships and went to shore and all. And uh, so, uh, but in, uh, and then we went into England on the train and then that, from there we went to, uh, uh, went to France. And they'd already, it was after D-Day, they was already fighting in France when we, when we went across. And uh, I think that we entered uh, the fighting there in France when they was fighting for Brest, France, there in southern France, and all. So, and all. So, you want to go to another deal now? This is uh, the citation here that I got for getting the Bronze Star Medal. This is the Bronze Star right up here. Of course, this is the Good Conduct Medal, which probably I didn't deserve. And all, and uh, this is uh, the, where I made, uh, I made experts on rifle and machine gun and everything. That's what these are all for, you know, and whatever. This is the 94th uh, pass that we wore, and, and the, this is after I, uh, got this bronze star medal. I, I was corporal when I got it, but uh, this was uh, after I got it. I was got got uh, rated, rating up to sergeant then, you know. And uh, this bronze star said, uh, uh, "I'd like to say this: that I wasn't trying to do anything heroic when I got this bronze star medal. I was just doing the job that that I was supposed to be doing." And th this is what the citation says. Uh, would you like to read it? Would you I'll want read. me to read it? You would, would you like to read it for them? I'll read it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It says, Corporal Jack D. Patterson, Cavalry 94th Reconnaissance Troop, United States Army, for mer meritorious, meritorious, a meritorious achievement in connection with military operations against an enemy of the United States in Germany the 20th of February 1945. During the assault on the town of Thorn, Germany, despite heavily artil heavy artillery and mortar fire, he was constantly in the leading echelon of the assault, always in front and in the thick of the fighting. By his aggressiveness and alertness, he shot the lead German of a small counterattack, causing the surrender of ten more. Corporal Patterson has constantly performed his duties in a highly credible manner and has proven himself as an outstanding soldier and squad leader in every engagement he has been in. He has successfully completed every mission that has been assigned to him. His aggressive actions and outstanding leadership reflect the highest credit upon himself and is in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Army. Wow. I don't know whether they deserve it or not, but I got it anyhow. <laughs> yeah. That's great. When we made that drive on the little town of Thorn, Germany, that we had, uh, uh, see, uh, they told us that day after we took that town and held it from, we jumped off that morning, that's the army talk, jumping off, starting that morning, that morning at 6 o'clock, and we took the town and held it, and they stepped throwing counterattacks at us. That's when and I stopped this one particular counterattack there. And uh, all in day, when we pulled back at 12 o'clock, 12.30 that day, and the 10th Armored Division come in and relieved us so we could pull back and, and get reorganized because we had a lot of casualties. And they told me, and I didn't have any reason to dispute it, that between 6 o'clock that morning and 12.30 that day, we had 63% casualties. 
Now that that was wounded and killed too, you know, because you always have more uh, wounded than you do killed, and you have to be pretty greedy to to handle it because, like when we was going into that town and my buddies was getting shot and laying there. Uh, begging for help, wanting help, I had to ignore them. And there's buddies that I'd been training with for a lot of months, and they, they became real close to me. But I, I couldn't afford to stop because that's the medic's place to come up and take care of them. My job was is to keep pursuing and, and trying to take care of, that, care of that guy that was doing that to us, you know. And that's what that's, uh, but it, you had to uh, kind of reach your teeth and go on, you know, and also. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Another thing I, the, the, about the, the enemy soldier, any time one or more than one, regardless of the number, surrendered to me, I didn't want to harm them. I appreciated them, but for that, for the reason that I didn't have to go and try to get them, and them still there trying to get me. Those I didn't have to worry about those that surrendered to me anymore. Then I, I really appreciated that about them. Yeah, surrendered mm -hmm. to me like that, you know, no, and uh, and. In a free place on this planet anywhere, not on the pl whole planet. Why don't you say that again? If if they had, if the, if the, if Germany and Japan had won this war, and all, there wouldn't be a free place on this planet anywhere. As they, you would instead of speaking English and Spanish, you'd have been speaking German and Japan, maybe uh, uh, Japanese rather. And uh, but I feel like that if they had have won this war that Hitler would have turned on Japan and tried to whip them because he wanted to be the ruler himself of the whole planet, you know. So I, I really feel that way about it, you know. And that this uh, Battle of the Bulge that we were in, uh, uh, it uh, lasted 41, 43 days, something like that. And we had 81,000 casualties during that time. And uh, Tell you, to tell you, give you an idea about how bad the winter was. It's one of the worst winters that they had there. Tell you, give you, between uh, November of uh, 44 and April of 45, we had 40,000 soldiers, 40,000 to go to the hospital with cold injuries, frozen feet, frostbite, and all. And that, and that, and that, and that something, and that amazing. It's, that it was that that bad. Besides having to fight that enemy, we was fighting that cold too. You know, all that mm. bad. You know. Yeah. So. Did you ever actually see Hitler? Did I? What? Did he really see Hitler? Did you ever see Hitler? Oh no, 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 huh? no, <laughs> no. Hitler. It wasn't, wasn't anybody. Wasn't any of us going to see Hitler? He was. He was back there somewhere hiding out. So. When we actually won the war, when we when he got whipped and bed, you know, he committed suicide, you know, mm -hmm. and he he killed himself, you know. No. Mm -hmm. Do y'all have some questions for him about the war? Were were you ever scared? I I tell people this. I kind of laugh about it and tell people this. I was scared one time. I, I I was scared when I first went into combat, and it lasted through the whole war. <laughs> yeah. In other words, he was scared yeah. the whole time. <laughs> well, I don't know whether you'd call that I was scared, but I was concerned. Because I, I, I always had one thing in my mind, and that's to get that other guy before he got me, keep him from getting me. And uh, that's one thing that I had in mind, and I think I've done a good job of it. I, uh, I was good enough with that rifle, and I think it's because of the way I was raised that there's one boy uh, that you know, shooting on the rifle range here in the States when we were training, there was one boy shot within four points of me. I was a high man with the rifle and then uh, uh, my outfit and there's one another boy shot within four points of me. Mm. Yeah. Tell them about the time when you, it was night and the, and you had to go in the water? In the? In the river? In the river? Yeah. Uh, well, this was before we jumped off, and that's another army talk. But before we started out to take this little town to Thorn, Germany, a day or two, uh, nine or two, or three, something like that, before the 20th of February, when we started that drive to take the town, we we, we would do our fighting in the daytime, and then you would hold at night, and hold at night. But you would uh, put outpost out to watch for the enemy coming in at night like that, or you would. 
uh, send out patrols to try to get through their lines to find out see what they had on the other side of their line. And all and the, these other three boys and I, and I was the point, always the point man for some reason or another. But anyhow, we was going to try to get through their lines there at this little town of Thorn, Germany. Okay, and this was in February now, about the, well, I will say the 16th, 17th, 18th of February, something like that at night. And this is night patrol, and that's when we send the patrols out at night. And it had been raining, the snow melted, and they had got this river running high out of, uh, up out of what we call in Georgia, out of the banks, you know. And it was, the river was up against this railroad embankment that followed the, this railroad followed the, uh, the river around the, the, by this little town here. And this river was up against this railroad embankment. And me and my three men that with me was over behind the railroad embankment next to the, the water there, slipping along there and going to get down here to this bridge of trussle, you know, call it, to try to get through and to get into behind their lines. But anyhow, the river made a curve and the railroad did too. And they had a machine gun set up around here, the Germans did, on the railroad, just for this real purpose, I guess, they're watching for us to try to get through their line. But anyhow, the, the, I guess they realized that we were there and they shot up this flare. Now, a flare is this deal that burst in the air and it burns for quite a little while and it lights up the ground down here where you can really see bright on the ground, good on the ground and laying down here. And uh, they shot that up over us there, then opened up on us with this machine gun. And when uh, uh, the, these uh, bullets and the machine guns, about every third or fourth or something like that, they called them tracer bullets. You could be shooting machine gun here, every one of them you could see it going through there. It had this little powder in it or something that was burning, making a little light, you know. Well, I was there seeing their the tracer bullets hitting in that railroad, railroad embankment above me there. And I thought, uh, so Jack, you've got to have protection. They, they, they one of them against you. If you don't, there wasn't anything there but for protection except that water. And uh, that was, we're talking about snow water now, that, that melted snow water and what have you, and the rain and the snow water, it's cold. And the only thing that's there for protection is that water. And so I slid off in that water there, right up around my neck here. And I started time or two to pull my head under it, but I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. And I'll, but kids, that water didn't feel cold to me. And uh, you was asking me about getting scared, you know. Reckon I was scared then as the reason why it wasn't getting cold. It didn't feel cold to me. Uh, uh, but it didn't. Uh, my, my adrenaline, whatever you call it, was probably so high or something I didn't, didn't realize it go. Well, after the flare went burned out and they quit shooting, uh, we we gone as far as we could because they'd located us. So I, got, I eased out and got my other three men and we headed back to our lines there. And when I got back to my lines there, I realized that my clothes was kind of getting cold and freezing. You know, my clothes that I had on was kind of freezing. They got me back there and got me down in the basement of an old building there and all, and where they could have a fire down there, you know, and all, and it got me warmed up and got me some dry clothes on, and, and I survived it, made it fine. I didn't even get a cold from it, and things, so I guess, I guess the good Lord was smiling on me, yeah. Yeah, I guess he was smiling on me, yeah. yeah. Tell, me tell us about um, Ona and your little girl and how they prayed for you while you were gone. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, I want to tell you, I'm going to tell you this about uh, the the... The mothers and also the wives during the war there. If I would have got killed, my wife would have got a telegram in her mailbox missing in action. And can you imagine what it would be like if your loved one is on the battlefield and that's the only way that you could hear about what happened. And you go to that mailbox out there and you'd wonder whether you was going to get a letter from him or whether you was going to get that telegram missing in action. And actually, I think it was harder on my wife mentally than it was me. I really think it's a lot harder on her mentally than it was me. But anyhow...